Hi everybody and welcome to Talk Gnosis. Tonight we're going to have our conversation with Dr. Jeffrey S. Kupperman, a friend of the show and my personal favorite Neoplatonist. He's joining us to talk about the Rosicrucians, and uh, in this first episode we're going to give a general overview of the Rosicrucians, who they were and where they came from. So stick around. Also, uh, just one programming note, uh, Brother Jonathan's uh, tooth is missing in this episode. He's in the middle of, some, of a series of dental surgery, so please give him some love on... Uh, over on Facebook and, uh, and let them know that, uh, that we're thinking about him and that we wish him a speedy recovery. At any rate, here's episode one of our four-part conversation with Dr. Jeffrey Kupperman about the Rosicrucians. So Dr. Kupperman, tell us, who were the Rosicrucians? Uh, where did they come from? And, and who was Christian Rosenkreutz? Oh, you know, that's, it's a tricky question to answer, especially when it comes to where did the Rosicrucians come from. There are some traditions that date them back to the 9th century or so. Mm-hmm. In Egypt, of all places, as, a, as an Arabic or, or Muslim order that then gets uh, you know, brought into the secret part of the Templars, because, of course, the Templars. Of course. Um, and then get, sort of re-manifest themselves in the 1600s when the Fama Tadish shows up. Um, and there is, of course, a, you know, a long tradition of uh, co-opting people into the Rosicrucian order long after they've died. So mm-hmm. almost anyone you could think of who, who at some point has had a rose somehow associated with them uh, has become a Rosicrucian. So Dante, for instance, because there is the, the rose of creation uh, in the Divine Comedy. Mm-hmm. Uh, Martin Luther, uh, you know, well known for his mysticism. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> because he has a rose cross in his coat of arms. Yes, of or, or Daniel Kramer, uh, the, the author of the so-called uh, Rosicrucian um, emblems, uh, which have nothing obviously Rosicrucian in them, except, you know, there's a rose at some point. Uh, and, Martin, and Kramer also has a rose cross uh, in his uh, coat of arms, which probably has nothing to do with the fact that he was a devout Lutheran and that he might have been copying Martin Luther, but instead he was, of course, a Rosicrucian. <laughs> They're because like that's the, how it uh, They're like the Mormons of the uh, the esoteric world. They're baptizing people after they're dead. I, uh, I can neither confirm nor deny that. <laughs> um, All right. So it, it's a movement that uh, a lot of gardeners, after they died, have been roped into. Yeah, so. yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, and then after they show up, everyone wants to be a member. Um, right. Whether or not they were is sort of a, a sort of different question. <laughs> Yeah, it's um, it's an interesting uh, set of of symbols to be sure, but um, not altogether unusual for the time, right? Like these are, you know, a rose and a cross uh, are fairly universal symbols at the time. Yeah, uh, they're 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 pretty much everywhere, and they have uh, a fair set of uh, standard Christian meanings. Mm-hmm. Uh, you don't need to go. To the Rosicrucians, to, to as soon as you see one, and go, oh well, clearly, <laughs> it, it, it's it's not like the the square and compass has become where you see that and you go, okay, Freemason. Right. You see a rose and a cross in the 1600s, it could mean almost anything. Mm-hmm. Which then you know leads us to, to Christian Rosencruz uh, himself, because you asked, you know, who who is this guy? Um, and the odds are he probably didn't exist uh, yep. because stories. Mm-hmm. Uh, rather, we don't even get his name until the third manifesto. He's just Brother CR, Brother CRC, uh, in, in the first two uh, manifestos. Uh, and the story that's in the Fama Fraternitatis says that he's, you know, the young son of a, a noble family who uh, enters into the monastery. Which, if put, placing this in a sort of a historical context, would suggest that if he was a real person and this was a real family then he would have been like a second or third son because he wasn't going to inherit anything. So, mm-hmm. you know, entered him in, into the, the clergy. And of course, he's super smart. And he travels the world learning the Kabbalah of all the different places, which, which seems to be the uh, uh, 17th century way of saying mysticism. Everything's now Kabbalah. Yeah. Mm. Um, so they're studying Arabic Kabbalah and Persian Kabbalah and, and of course, Jewish Kabbalah, and it's, well, they don't mean what we mean by it today, mm-hmm. it, it seems. Um, but mostly, he is a sort of archetypal figure uh, at the center of, of the Rosicrucian movement or the Rosicrucian order. 
He is this figure who kind of knows everything. He collects the wisdoms of the world and he gathers it all together and sort of um, codifies it into a single system of knowledge uh, that he then gathers a bunch of other people together uh, into their sanctum sanctorum, their, their, their Rosicrucian mountain. Uh, and they, everybody learns it and then they go out into the world professing to do nothing but to heal the sick and that for free. Mm-hmm. What is he based on? You know, my, my, my favorite pet theory, and it's my favorite because it's mine, um, <laughs> is that he is largely based on Marsilio Ficino, uh, the, the Renaissance yeah. Neoplatonist. Uh, and I come to that uh, largely through um, uh, Valentinus's connection um, to Tommaso Campanella, uh, who was a student of Ficino's work. Um, and he was a writer uh, of utopic uh, visionary stories and things like that, which Valentinus was uh, as or Valentinus was as well. Um, and so we can sort of see in uh, Ficino, this guy who you know collected all of this knowledge, Hermetic knowledge, Neoplatonic knowledge, Platonism, all of this stuff, uh, and brought it all together, supposedly started the uh, Platonic Academy, though there's a lot of debate over whether or not that was a real thing. Um, and then he disseminated that knowledge just like Christian Rosenkreutz does. Now, uh, Fischino doesn't live to be like 108 years old, and he doesn't have his body hidden in a secret vault, so far as we know. <laughs> uh, but he, he, CRC seems to be this sort of amalgam of, of wisdom figures. Uh, there's certainly a, a bit uh, of Christ in there with, with his death and not really being resurrected. Uh, but, but being found again in, in the sort of the resurrection of the order after his, uh, the discovery of his tomb. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And for those of you playing the drinking game along at home, it's about five and a half minutes for a so far as we know from Dr. Kupperman. So that's <laughs> everybody take a drink. <laughs> so uh, so Dr. Kupperman, the, uh, the, the, found, the founder of the order, is, uh, is, is probably mythical um we're not quite sure where it started like what is what where how do we know about these rosicrucians what what are they where did they come from what are these uh these manifestos that you you mentioned earlier so we know about them largely outside of these nebulous traditions that you know we can ever actually get any solid evidence of of of, uh, historical veracity outside of those we have these three so-called rosicrucian manifestos there's the uh, the first was the Fama Fraternitatis, which was published in 1614. And then I think a year le- later, there's the Confessio Fraternitatis. And then a bit later, we have the Chemical Wedding, uh, which is sort of a, uh, a, a play almost, or uh, an allegory. Mm. Uh, the, first of, the first of these two, uh, the Fama, or the, or the discovery of the fraternity of the most laudable order of the Rosy Cross, uh, because long names in Latin are fun. Uh, is basically the the story of Christian Rosenkreutz or CRC and his traveling about the world, everything I was just talking about, uh, and the initial formation of the order and their basic set of rules. Uh, the first, there are like five or six of them, the first of which is that they profess to do nothing except to heal the sick and that gratis. And then there are other things like they don't dress in any special way so they can blend in with the pe- with the people and things like that. Uh, the Confessio comes out like, the next year. These are all, these are published in, in Kessel, uh, Germany, I believe. Um, and it is really, it's a discussion of Rosicrucian philosophy. So it goes more deeply into what it means to be a Rosicrucian. The, the first one, the Fama, was really sort of interesting. Because it says, hey, we exist. Mm-hmm. Come join us. All you have to do is let it be known that you want to join us and someone will get in contact with you. <laughs> Don't call Which us, far we'll as, call you. Yeah, <laughs> or no, call us and we promise we will totally call you back. <laughs> it, it's, it's right up there with other things to do, like destroy the papacy. Um, and, <laughs> and, and, the, and the Fama and the Confessio are, are fairly anti-papal. Uh, we, we're very confident in, in a Lutheran uh, origin uh, to these uh, writings. Um, whether anybody was ever actually contacted again... Sure, let's go with that. Uh, again, you know, there's, there's no way of knowing um, if, if there was ever a group, uh, any actual group behind it or not. Of course, again, all the modern Rosicrucian orders, of which there are a plethora, um, they all, of course, say we go all the way back to the original Rosicrucians, mm-hmm. whoever those might have been. <laughs> 
So the chemical wedding is a bit different from the other two um, manifestos. Uh, this was written in 1616 or published in 1616, just a year after the Confessio, two years after the Fama. Um, we actually know who wrote this, uh, a, a Lutheran by the name of uh, Johann Valentin André. Uh, this is the guy who was influenced by uh, Tommaso Campanella that I mentioned before. Um, and he's the son of a, uh, of a Lutheran minister himself, is, is in a seminary. And instead of being a dry uh, history or a bunch of philosophy, uh, the chemical wedding uh, is a C-H-Y-M-I-C-A-L, uh, which is a reference to, to alchemy, <clears throat> uh, is well, it's an alchemical or is often interpreted as being an alchemical allegory. And so it has the character of Christian Rosencruz, we finally get his name. Uh, and he has this almost Dante-like uh, vision, not of heaven and hell, because that would have been really interesting. Uh, but instead of this, this seven-day journey that he takes to the wedding of a king and a queen, uh, who we really never get their name because they're not actually people. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. And so it, it is this... this, this I almost hesitate to say beautiful allegory. It probably isn't the original German. Um, it is this this allegory of uh, chemical al alchemical symbolism, uh, the the role of Eros and Venus. Um, there's a lot of uh, symbolism using the number seven. So there's a lot of planetary stuff sort of going on in the background. Uh, it's also a moral allegory uh, as well. Um, and if we take this in connection with the the Fama and the Confessio. It sort of comes across as being, you know, how do you live your life as a Rosicrucian in, in, in a spiritual way? Mm -hmm. uh, and the, the, the author himself, uh, uh, Andre, is, is interesting because it's, he's thought to be a brother AI in the Fama Fraternitatis, so that he is part of this circle, uh, according to some at least, that, that produced the Fama and the Confessio in the first place, though there's a disagreement on that. Sure, as with all secret documents, uh, yes, yeah, <clears throat> they don't come right out and say it. So we put a bunch of stuff in there that we, that we want to believe, I guess. Um, you mentioned in the Confessio that there it was a listing of um, kind of the 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 way that people uh, or what the Rosicrucians believed. Can you go into a little bit more detail about that? Yeah, so this was uh, uh, the, sort of the overall philosophy of the of the the Rosicrucians, um, and you can get. You know, you can find versions of, of the translations all over the place. Mm -hmm. uh, there are certainly a bajillion different ones on uh, the Internet, though they're all really old and kind of bad. <laughs> uh, uh, but the, the, the Rosicrucian philosophy, uh, you know, it's, it's a mystical philosophy. It's, it's a, a contemplative philosophy, philosophy uh, as well. Um, <clears throat> it, 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 as we get from the Fama, it, it, it is... Uh, has a lot to do with healing. Uh, um, Paracelsus is, is mentioned, uh, for instance. He seems to be the, the main alchemical influence or alchemical influence on Rosicrucianism. Um, and of course, he, uh, he was a physician, much like uh, Ficino was before him. Um, so we have this, this uh, very strong notion of healing. There, there is, of course, disagreement on whether this is supposed to be physical healing or spiritual healing. Uh, my guess would be both uh, considering uh, the people who are cited um, and sort of the language that that's used and of course the overall sort of mystical nature of, of Rosicrucianism and uh, the alchemy uh, that's that's mentioned um, that's sort of a, a, a beginning the, the the confessio itself is not super lengthy um, but it goes into a, a lot of different areas uh, but that healing aspect is is really quite primary in, in, in Rosicrucian philosophy, mm -hmm. uh, which is something that itself is quite interesting because when you look at modern Rosicrucian uh, organizations, you know the first rule uh, uh, in the in the Fama for the Rosicrucians is we profess to do nothing except heal the sick and that gratis, mm -hmm. and you now almost never see that in, in any of the modern Rosicrucian groups, especially the more magically oriented ones. That's it for part one. In part two, we're going to discuss whether the Rosicrucian manifestos, the original manifestos, were actually a hoax or not. 
Um, we're going to talk about what happened to that, uh, the, the Rosicrucian ideas right afterwards, and we're going to talk about some organizations that sprung up. Also, the influences of Hermeticism and Platonism on, uh, on Rosicrucian thought. So stick around for that coming up next week on Talk Gnosis.